We don't, in this culture, teach people how to operate their mind and body. Don't spend so much time trying to suppress negative thoughts. If you need trauma therapy, pursue that with a professional. But if you have negative thoughts, just remember, I can also introduce positive thoughts. The same way I can control running around the block. Positive thoughts are the equivalent of forward physical action. And if you reward them internally, you buffer yourself against the quitting circuit. You are building a stronger version of yourself completely between your own ears. And some people say, well, that's silly. It's like you're saying, oh, I'm going to jump up and down, reward myself for doing nothing. No, you're building the neural circuits that reward that you can control self reward. And in doing that, you can push through days and weeks of effort consistently. I don't mean necessarily all nighters, but you can push and push and push. How do you get motivated? Well, one way to do that is if you are good at subjectively attaching dopamine to the pursuit, just knowing, okay, I really am hungry for this. I'm just, I'm going to tell myself that, you know, making, you know, making it 1% of the way is a success and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep ratcheting on. And that's great if you can do that. But for people that can't do that, understanding this relationship with the pe pleasure pain balance can be more powerful. Just understanding the more friction and pain that you experience, the greater the dopamine reward you will get later. And that serves as its own amplifier of the whole process of pursuing more dopamine. And then the other aspect of it is that anytime that we're leaning into action, it, you know, it has the, possibility of being an amplifying process or a depleting process. And the key to that is making sure that you're balancing the dopamine and epinephrine systems. The huge wins are great, but it's really about rewarding these increments so you can keep going another 30, another 40 years, 50 years, 100 years, if that's how long, you know, if David Sinclair has his way, you know, um, we'll live 100 more years, all of us. So learning to control these rewards is absolutely key. There is no guidebook for social interactions, for sexual development. It's super, it's a huge problem. And I think that um, the brain is harder to, you know, identify like a user's manual, right? Because it's always meditation, consciousness, high level concepts. What do dreams mean? The really interesting stuff. Right. But I like that we're starting with physiology because what's nice about these core mechanisms of brain body is that they are real things. Like if we could point to the neurons, these are things in the textbooks. There's nothing mysterious. It doesn't require any learning. Like once you know how to do it, it works the first time it works every time. Taking stress, which is wired into us in order to make us feel agitated instead of suppressing us, you know, instead of saying, you know, what, I'm just going to sit here. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to move into action. So there's a circuit for winning. There's a, the same circuit when it's hypoactive, not active enough is what causes losing in these competitive scenarios. And similarly, there's a circuit for quitting. There's an, a norepinephrine circuit in the brainstem. This was published in the last couple of years, showing that when animals or people are in constant effort, eventually that level of norepinephrine gets so high that it triggers a circuit that shuts down the motor control over the limbs. And you just say, that's it. I give up. I'm done. So these mechanisms were hardwired into us. We all have them. Whether or not it's from evolution, mother nature, God, the universe, it is, it's irrelevant to the discussion that these circuits exist in everybody. And I think it's a select few people who really understand that forward action is what drives these circuits. It's the ability to take that agitation, stress, agitation, increase our focus, and they bias us for movement. And nature wanted that. They want us to move forward in the face of challenge, not to be quiescent. We weren't sitting around battling tigers and saber toothed tigers all the time. More likely we were in caves and we were getting hungry and we had to go out and search for things. Agitation and stress were designed to get us up and move us. And when we try and fight that too much and we try and quiet that stress, that actually can be problematic. If you can start to identify the craving as its own internally released drug, this thing, dopamine, that is a source of motivation, then what you realize is that capturing the reward is wonderful, but attaching dopamine to the reward is actually a little bit dangerous. And when I said dopamine is what's setting the, your time perception, it's an interval timer. What you're saying is, it's like the two marshmallow experiment done at Stanford, def defer the dopamine and actually, if you can, turn the weighting into the dopamine and then 
you can extend out the reward for you know waiting for the second marshmallow 15 minutes later, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many, many examples of this in the psychology and, and neuroscience literature. And I would say finally, in 2020, we finally as a field got a clear idea of how dopamine is really working. If you can start to register, ah, that craving and that friction and that desire, that almost kind of low level of agitation, sometimes high level of agitation, that is that I'm trying to impose my will on the world in a benevolent way, we hope, that's dopamine. It's working with its close cousin, which is epinephrine, which is adrenaline. They are very close cousins. In fact, dopamine manufactures epinephrine. A lot of people don't know this, but adrenaline is actually made from the molecule dopamines. Okay, so those two are hanging out together. It's like crave work, crave work, crave and work, crave and work, crave and work. And then you get the win. And some people allow the big peak in dopamine to be associated with the win. And smart people learn to adjust their celebration internally, right? This is all internal. You could throw the biggest party in the world, but as long as you're kind of in, laid back and looking at this, not letting yourself get manic crazy, you won't necessarily crash as hard and pretty soon your system will reset so that you take the day, you clean up the dishes, you relax, you go, what now? I'm feeling a little low. Well, rather than going out and spiking your dopamine again, just wait, understand that the scale will reset again. Give yourself a few days where you're gonna feel a little kind of underwhelmed. Things aren't gonna be as interesting. It's gonna be hard to trigger that big release because you just had the, the peak. Well. If you adjust that, you relax, you understand there's always a little bit of a postpartum depression. We sometimes hear about postpartum depression, that's a clinical thing, but there's always that kind of, hmm, today's not as exciting as the previous days. What, what am I gonna do with my life? But then, if you let it start ratcheting up again, then what you realize is your capacity to tap into dopamine as a motivator, not just seeking dopamine rewards, that is infinite. And I, I can say with, with great certainty that this is, how you were able to build a big company and sell it, how you've been able to build a successful podcast and sell it, how you're constantly seeking because seeking is the reward. And I think for most people, we think of the reward as the finish line. And so the key is to get to the finish line, step into the end zone, but no end zone dance. It's just like, yep, and now I'm gonna go do it again. You have to decide, are you gonna try and quiet stress or are you gonna actually lean into action? That's a critical choice point for everybody who's experienced anything negative or positive for that matter.